We are in the middle of a series in the book of 1 Peter, so I hope that you've got your Bible with you. If you don't, if you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to grab the one uh, there in front of you. Uh, it's a black uh, Bible there in front of you, and you're welcome to take that with you uh, if you don't have one at home. Uh, but turn with me to 1 Peter. We're going to be looking at that today. As we get started, um, at our house, uh, we've been kicking around this idea of uh, building the girls uh, some loft beds in their bedroom. And uh, so, like many things, uh, our tools are not yet unpacked from our move, and they're sitting somewhere uh, in a box in our garage. And so Ashley did the natural thing, my wife did, and she turned to Facebook and and asked for some tools and said, does anybody have any tools that we can borrow? And I don't know whether you saw the little exchange on Facebook or not, but some of my friends, not her friends, but my friends, uh, jumped up in utter uh, surprise um, or um, they chimed in with utter shock might be the right word. And here's what one of my friends said, you, Alan, you're going to really build something? Really? Well... The truth of the matter is, they knew what they were talking about. You don't have to be around me very long to discover that I am no Bob the Builder. And uh, so uh, Ashley's going to tackle that task, and I'll be her gopher boy uh, to help out with that task. The good news this morning is that God's not asking me to build something. Instead, God is building something in me, and we can see something exciting that's going to come about because of what God's doing in me and what God's doing in you and how God is building us into something special. So like I said, we're in the middle of a, of a series on the book of 1 Peter. We've called it Living with Hope. And the reason we've called it that is because um, chapter 1, verse 3, Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So our hope, our living hope, is founded on the fact that Jesus died for our sins in our place and was resurrected again. And so, so that's why we're calling this series, called, uh, calling it Living with Hope, is because everything we go through life needs to be framed through that promise that we have hope because of Jesus Christ. Now this morning we're going to dive more deeply into chapter 2, so I want to read for us uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, and here's what it says. As you come to him, and now remember, it's talking about Jesus here when it says him. Uh, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy but now you have received mercy. Now, I hope that you'll have your worship guide handy because on the back of it, there is a little bit of an outline that you can follow along with us as we move through here. But you saw, hopefully, in verse 4 that Jesus is referred to as a living stone. Now, just a moment ago, I read chapter 1, verse 3, and we see that he's a living hope. And then another time in the verses we've already read uh, previously, in chapter 1, verse 23, Jesus is called the living word of God. So three times from 1 Peter 1 through uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, we see Jesus referred to as living three different times. He's the living hope, he's the living word of God, and now we see that he is a living stone. The reason he's called living is because he is alive. He is alive. We celebrate this thing every spring called Easter, 
And the purpose of Easter is a reminder of what historically, factually took place, that Jesus did not stay dead in the tomb, but he was raised to new life. And the reason I point Easter out is because if we're not careful, we, we, we maintain that story just to Easter and we celebrate it. The reality is that every day of our life, we should be walking through in the, the joy and, and, and excitement of the fact that Jesus is no longer dead, he is alive. That ought to be something that gets us excited. So he's a living hope. He, he is the living hope. He's the living word of God and he's a living stone. Another aspect of the fact that he's living is not only that he's alive, but it's the fact that those who come to him in faith and in repentance experience life. He gives life. So not only is he alive, but he gives life. And the way that he gives life is when we come to him. Verse 4 uses that terminology, as you come to him. That's when we experience him as a living stone. So, what does it mean to come to him? It means to follow him. It means to believe in him. It means to trust him. It's to believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way to the Father except by him. It's that kind of coming to him coming to Jesus does not just mean come to church coming to Jesus does not just mean learn a few Bible verses coming to Jesus is coming in a posture of faith and trust and repentance and believing that he is the way for salvation so it says that whenever we do that that he becomes in that sense our living stone and so on your notes there it says that we are to put our hope because this is called living hope, uh, living with hope, and we're looking at the hope uh, recurring theme that happens throughout the book of First Peter. Putting our hope in Jesus, the living stone, is what it's all about. Now, you may be thinking, well, why is Jesus called a stone? Like, it seems weird that he's called a living stone, because most stones I've ever been around aren't living. Um, and so then Jesus is called the living stone. Like, what is meant by this concept of calling him a stone? So let's look at verse 6. He quotes a, a scripture verse, uh, and, and what we see here is, he says, for it stands in scripture, in other words, it says in scripture, behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so whenever Peter uses this terminology of calling Jesus a living stone, part of what he's doing is he's pointing back to the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Old Testament that point to the coming Messiah who is Jesus and so sometimes if we're not careful we go you know what that Old Testament stuff is long and, and it seems repetitive at times and I don't understand it and so I'm just going to kind of stick with the New Testament and, and I'll leave others to study the Old Testament the reality is we need to understand the context of all of God's Word and as we understand the Old Testament it helps us better understand the New Testament so Peter quotes scripture in this portion of uh, several places but in this particular portion he quotes scripture that talks about the coming messiah who would be called the cornerstone and so he calls jesus our living stone there now the verse that he quotes actually comes from a couple places in the old testament it comes from psalm uh, a psalm and it also comes from isaiah and so uh, in both places I, 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 we see that that um that there's a promise of, a, of an anointed one that would be coming that would be our stone. Also, what we need to understand is that in the Old Testament, Israel was very clearly God's chosen kingdom, chosen people. And Jerusalem was seen as the holy city, right? Because God's very presence was believed to be completely uh, in, in, in involved there in the city of Jerusalem because of the temple and, and the holy of holies and all of that. And so whenever the terminology of stone is used in the Old Testament, oftentimes it's identified not, not just with the anointed one coming, but also more along the lines of within the scope of Judaism, within uh, Israel as a nation, and, and, Ju and, um, and the temple itself. And so whenever the word stone is used, that's kind of some of the frame of reference that would come into people's minds. And then in the middle of the city was the temple and that temple was seen, as I said a moment ago, kind of the center of God's activity. And so that's kind of the frame reference uh, that is put into place as, as he quotes this verse, talking about Jesus being the stone. Now, Jesus 
we're not going to take the time to read it, but you can jot it down. In Matthew chapter 21, um, the last week of Jesus' life before his crucifixion, Jesus comes into the city of Jerusalem. He's actually in the temple, who's, which is built out of these huge stones. I had the privilege of going to, um, to Israel back in the day, and part of the temple is still standing. The western wall is. And these blocks are, I mean, 10 or 100 ton size stones. So these are huge stones, okay, that, are, that make up this, this temple. And so here he is in the middle of a temple that's built out of these huge, enormous architectural design of stones, and Jesus tells a parable one day because the chief priest in, in Matthew chapter 1 ask him, by whose authority is he teaching? Jesus begins to answer that question by telling a parable, and then he ends it with this verse that I just read in verse 6 and talks about the cornerstone and, and applying that imagery of the cornerstone instead to himself instead of to Judaism, Jerusalem, or the temple. And so Peter picks up on this concept and begins to refer to Jesus as the cornerstone. We just sang about Jesus being our cornerstone, that the cornerstone is the foundation of it all, and so therefore we can refer to Jesus as a cornerstone. It says that Jesus was chosen by God and that Jesus is precious and that he is the cornerstone or foundation for a spiritual house, which is the church. Here's my question for each of us, though. What have you done with Jesus? Is he the cornerstone of your life? Or is he something other than that? You have two options. You can come to Jesus in belief, or you can come to Jesus and reject him in disobedience. Look at verses 6 through 8. It stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes, so there's that one option, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, so here's the second option, to not believe in him. It says the stone that the builders rejected, so you can not believe, you can reject him, and yet he has become the cornerstone. And it says in verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. So my question is, will you or have you chosen to believe in Jesus and to not be put to shame, or have you chosen to stumble over and reject him? At the end of verse 8, I just read, it says that they rejected him by disobeying the word. The word here, it, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, and that's the gospel word of Jesus. So we're presented with the gospel, and here's what the gospel says. The gospel says that you and I we're made to bring honor and glory to God, and yet there's a problem. Sin got in the way. That because of the first man, Adam, and because of our choices, we are, are creatures that are sinners. And because of our sin, our sin completely separates us from God. That there's nothing that I can do to be made right with God. There's nothing I can do to earn his favor. There's nothing that I can do to get uh, back in, into a relationship with him. But that I am doomed and destined to death. Not only physical death, but more importantly, the spiritual death. Totally, completely separated from God for all eternity. But then the gospel good news is that this cornerstone, Jesus Christ, he came to live on this earth. He lived a perfect life. And that while we deserve death for our sin, Jesus willingly took upon his shoulders our sin, our punishment, and died in our place so that if we would trust in him, our sins could be forgiven. And as we saw in chapter 1, verse 3, is our living hope because of his resurrection, the important thing is not that he just died in our place on the cross, but that he was raised three days later, defeating death, defeating sin, defeating its punishment, and resurrected to life. So here we stand at a crossroad. Peter says you can either believe in the cornerstone and therefore not be put to shame, or it says you can disbelieve in the cornerstone and reject him and stumble over him. My question for you is, what have you done with Jesus? Have you accepted him as your savior? Have you, have you accepted him as the living stone of your life? Are you building your life on him, or are you just trying to do your own thing and sometimes include him when it is appropriate or feels good to you. We're going to keep moving through this scripture. Continue to think on that thought. Look at verse 5. It says that you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through 
Jesus Christ. So I said at the beginning that we are to put our hope in Jesus, who is the living stone. Once we have made that decision and received the forgiveness of our sins, then verse 5 points out to us that he, God, is building us up as his spiritual house. Now, I said a moment ago, I'm not much of a builder. The good news is God knows what he's doing when he builds his spiritual house, the church. So God is building us up, those of us that have trusted in him, into his spiritual house. You see, Jesus is the living stone, and because of that, those who have trusted in him are like, it says in verse 5, living stones that he is building into a spiritual house, which is his temple. There's a couple of temple images here. You may be wondering, what, why, why are we talking about temples? Well, temples in the Old Testament, the temple in the Old Testament represented God's presence. It represented a place of worship. It, it was where they had the, the Holy of Holies, where God was understood to have dwelt there. And so whenever Peter says, but there's something different now, he's building us, believers in Jesus, the church, into his spiritual house so that we are his temple. It's saying we don't have to go to Jerusalem. We don't have to go somewhere else to worship him, but instead we are the temple of God as he builds us. And so there's a couple of images that he uses here in reference to the temple in verse 5. He talks about holy priesthood. He calls us holy priesthood. A little side note here. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I've got good news for you today. You are now a priest. You know, Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for that. You can still be married to be this kind of priest, all right? So it's okay. It says that we're priests who offer spiritual sacrifices of praise to God. So there's that, that, that temple imagery that's here. I want us to remember, though, what it's all about. We're not empowered to do that on our own, but it says in the verse, end of verse 5, it says acceptable to God, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So our, the fact that we are a temple of God, the fact that we are being made into priests, the fact that we're able to, to present spiritual sacrifice to God is not because of us, but again, it's through Jesus Christ himself. And we can't miss that point. All of this reminds me of what P Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Here's what Paul says. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And here's what the household of God is about. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for, God's, for God by the Spirit. So the glory of God abides permanently and powerfully in us through the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what, what um, Howard said a moment ago with the phone? Not the funny stuff, but the serious stuff. He said that, that we, as followers of Jesus, have the Holy Spirit living within us, and he is the one that empowers us to live for God. And so the good news here is that we are the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells within us in all of his power. Now let's keep going. Let's look at the beginning of verse 9. Peter says you can choose, you have two options, either to trust in Jesus or to disbelieve in him. But the good news is, he said in verse 9, those of us that have trusted in him, it says, but you are a chosen race. It says you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And we'll stop right there. At one time, these types of titles, these types of privileges, these types of blessings were reserved for ethnic Israel. If you don't believe me, let me read one uh, set of verses for you in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6 say this. Now therefore, you, if you will indeed obey my voice and hear my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. But the amazing news is that those same titles, privileges, and blessings are actually given to us that are New Testament believers in Jesus Christ. And Peter uses four categories. Did you see that in verse 9? He says that we're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a, a holy nation, and a people for God's possession. I want us to look at that real quickly. 
when he says that we're a chosen race, it's the exact same word that's used in verse 6, where in verse 6 it talks about Jesus being the cornerstone who is chosen by God. And so those of us that are believers in Jesus make up a chosen race, chosen by God, that regardless of our ethnicity, that believers in Jesus and Christ are united by faith in Jesus to be his chosen people. This isn't an ethnic race that he's talking about when he says that we're a chosen race. And this is not a race of people that's determined by our color or our culture, instead is determined by our creed which is defined by the one who we believe in, Jesus Christ. But what I do want us to see is this, that when we pray for our brothers and sisters in China or other places in the country, when we pray for our brothers and sisters that have different skin colors and different skin tones than we do, they are one with us because we all make up the chosen race of God's people. The other section it says here is that we're a royal priesthood. We're not just a passive building that Jesus is building into his temple, but instead we're an active participant in it, that we're to actively worship God. In the Old Testament, the priests or the priesthood would bring sacrifices into the tabernacle, and it was a perpetual thing that they had to do over and over and over and over again. The good news is the altar has been replaced by Jesus' once and for all sacrifice on our behalf. That as priests of the kingdom of God, we don't have to bring in sacrifices, that'd be a bit messy. But instead, Jesus is the once and for all of all times. It says that we're royal because we are priests of the king of kings. Now there's a theological principle that you may or may not have heard of before. It's called the priesthood of all believers. The priesthood of all believers teaches us and reminds us that based on this scripture and others like it, that we don't have to go through a mediator that's a human to get to God. But instead, Jesus died in my place, and because I'm a follower of Jesus, now I have direct access because of the blood of Jesus Christ to get to the Father. And so when it says we're a priest, that's part of what it's saying, that I have direct access to God because of what Jesus has done on my behalf. But it also means that as believers in Jesus, that we're to serve the role of a priest by pointing others to Jesus. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But a priest has this connotation of the word bridge. A bridge, it, 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 by its very definition, kind of defines itself by talking about a mediator. We're not a mediator between people and God, but instead we know the mediator that is available, and that's Jesus Christ. And as a part of the royal priesthood, we point others to the hope that's found in him. One other aspect I want you to see. Did you see that it says that we're being made into a royal priesthood? It doesn't say that each of you are a royal priest. Let me describe what I mean by that. All too often in our Western individualized culture that even bleeds over into Christianity and to the church, we kind of say, okay, I'm the priest of God. I better go out and do this thing. And yes, we are supposed to do that, but we're supposed to do it corporately as the body. So the good news is that we have each other, not just living hope, but other Bible-believing churches that we're called to be out, go out and be corporately the priesthood of God. So let's love one another well as we serve one another to go out and tell others of the hope that's found in Jesus. The other aspect that he says here is that we're a holy nation. The word holy has this idea of being set apart, being sanctified, being cleaned and, and made pure, and also being set apart for God's purposes. We won't take the time to look back at it, but you can jot it down in chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, it, it quotes um, an Old Testament verse where Peter reminds us that God says, you shall be holy for I am holy because God is calling us to be set apart from the ways of the, of the world and set apart for his purposes. So as the church, not just living hope, but the church, our job is to be recognized that we're a holy nation set apart for the, his purposes and his plans. And then it says that we are people for his possession. No doubt everything in this world is owned by God. God says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns everything. But there's something special and significant about those of us that have trusted in Jesus for our salvation where we are his unique possession. This is a possession of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. We are his. We are children of God, adopted and cherished by him. Let me say that again. We are children of God, adopted and cherished by him. 
My family and I had the pri privilege of adopting a son. Many people in this church family have experienced that as well. And I don't know what happened. And in fact, we had two get adopted this week, which is so exciting. We're happy for you, Daily Family. That is amazing. We, um, we were at the courthouse the day that James was adopted by us. And the, the last thing I remember the judge saying to me before he hit his gavel and said, James Ken Pittman is now officially our son. The last thing he said to me was, Mr. Pittman, what you need to understand is that by this act, everything you own is now his. He is an heir to what you own. Now, I don't know whether the judge is a believer in Jesus or not, but if that's not biblically true, I don't know what it is. We are people of his possession, which means we are heirs to the throne of God. Not, not to usurp the throne of God, hear me? <laughs> we're, we're heirs to being in the presence of God, is what I'm saying. So we are people of his possession. We are adopted and cherished by him. Now, remember who... Peter's audience is. Do you remember? Chapter 1, verse 1 says that they are in exile. Can you imagine if they're in exile, they feel so out of place. They're not at home. They're not in the normal place. They're experiencing hardship and trials and difficulties, and maybe they don't feel significant. They're not in Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was kind of the hub of everything. That's where it was understood that the center of God's activity was taking place. And at the end of this, the audience of Peter were able to see that they are not outsiders. Rather, they are insiders. They are very dear and near to God, and they are at the center of God's activity in the world because they are being built into the temple of God. And the same is true for me and you. Maybe you feel insignificant. Maybe you feel unimportant. Maybe you feel like you don't know where you connect and where your place in this world is, and you know you trust in Jesus and you've received that salvation, but you don't really know what's going on and you feel insignificant. The reality is that you, because you are a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a person or people of his possession, you are in the thick of what God is doing in this world. We are God's special people with a special task. So I want us to look at the last two verses to see what that's about. Verses 9 and 10. I want to read 9 again because I want it to really sink in. We can flip through these four phrases and really miss the significance of it. So let's read 9 and 10. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here's what we need to see. That everything that we have discussed today is true for an express purpose, and it's there on your notes, so that we might proclaim his excellencies to a hopeless world. You see, we don't need to just live with hope. We need to go out into a world that's not living with hope and point them to the hope that's found in Jesus and therefore be serving in the role of a priest to tell others about Jesus. You see, the church exists to make known the attributes and the greatness and grace of God. There's three different things that I noticed in verses 9 and 10 that seem to point to what does it mean to point to God's excellency. The first one is this, that we're to call people out of dark into his marvelous light. What I mean by that is that people around us are spiritually blind to the beauty and excellency of Jesus. And that we are here to help them see the light of who Jesus is to be awakened from their spiritual darkness of death and deception and hopelessness to show them the light that's found in Jesus Christ. You see, God awakens, needs to awaken our friends and our coworkers and our neighbors to the reality of the spiritual things so that they can be awoken to the hope that's found in Jesus. Another thing that he says is that we are to help them become God's people. We're to help them become God's people, and he says that we're to help them receive mercy. I'm kind of tying those two together. To point towards God's excellency means that we're to help people see that they can become his people because right now they are not, and we need to help them see that right now they're not receiving mercy, but they can receive mercy. And the reason I lump those two together is because of something else that's found in the Old Testament. Anybody in here ever read the Old Testament prophet by the name of Hosea? 
Don't freak out on me. Isaiah and Jeremiah have 60 chapters, um, uh, 60 plus chapters. Hosea has six, I believe. Hosea, if you've not read it, is a very interesting read. Uh, Parents, you may want to read it before you read it out loud to your kids. Oftentimes, the prophets would have something happen in their lives that would be factual and reality that God would then use to manipulate, not manipulate, but be used to orchestrate a biblical truth uh, for all of us to see. I'm glad I'm not an Old Testament prophet. So Hosea is married to Gomer. Let's just put it this way. Gomer appears to have had the oldest profession in the book, if you follow what I'm saying. Gomer represented the nation of Israel who would wander from God. Hosea was not God, but he represented God in this picture. And that Hosea was to pursue his wife, even though she was stepping out on him and being unfaithful. On top of that, he had the privilege of naming uh, his kids that were object lessons. Okay, He had three kids, one that doesn't really fit into these two uh, little descriptions of being people of God when we weren't, or having mercy when we didn't. Here's what his two kids' names were, though that I do want to mention. One was named Lo-Ami. The word Lo means not, and Ami means people. So this kid's name was Not My People. That's what, it, that's, what, that's what his name was. When he met somebody, he goes, Hi, my name is Not My People. And the reason it was is because while, as, as Israel was acting in an, in, an, in an unrepentant way, God was saying, You're not my people because you're not following my way. And so he had the privilege of being called Lo-Ami. Then his daughter had the name of lo Ruhama. Lo means not. Ruhama has within it the context of mercy, and so her name is No Mercy. So she, we got n- n- Not My People and No Mercy. That's what his kids' names were. But as the story continues, and like I said, you should read Hosea. It's, it's quite interesting. In chapter 2, verse 23, here's what God says. I will say to not my people, you are my people. And then he says, and I will have mercy on no mercy. So the amazing thing is, these, ki- these poor kids had these object lessons for names so that God could say, I can redeem you. Even though you aren't my people, I want to make you my people. Even though you don't know my mercy, I want to shower you with my mercy. There are people all around us that are literally not God's people. Yes, he made them and loves them and created them, but they are damned to hell. I chose that word on purpose to try to grab our attention. But we have the privilege to be able to point to them and say, but God can redeem it and he wants to make you his people. We, we know people that don't know the mercy and grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ and they are no mercy. But we're not going to flaunt it in their face and go, ha, na, na, na. We're going to instead point out that mercy can be found at the cross of Jesus. And so here's the interesting fact, and I've got it down as our bottom line, that you and I have been chosen by God to tell the world just how wonderful he is. In other words, we're called to go out and be priests to the nations to tell them of the hope that's found in Jesus Christ. So every person on this planet is confronted with the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus Christ. And this cornerstone can then, uh, through trust in Jesus Christ, can be the foundation for a life that's built on the hope that's found in Jesus. Or this cornerstone can be large and bulky and people can trip over that cornerstone and reject the hope that's found in him. So I've got two, two important questions for you. And that is, what have you done with this cornerstone? Have you trusted in him for salvation? Do you have hope in this living stone by the name of Jesus Christ? And if you have, are you going out and telling others? Now again, I want to remind you that we are a priesthood, meaning that we're going out together to do this. That's why we've got some mission trips planned. If you haven't seen our mission trip dates yet, you, you want to go out um, in the front entryway after church is over with and maybe sign up for a mission trip coming up next year. But here's the deal. We don't need to just share the hope of Jesus out there, we need to share the hope of Jesus here in our neighborhoods and in our city. So the good news is we're being built into the temple of God for an express purpose of pointing to the excellencies that are found in Jesus. This morning, I'd encourage you to respond as God leads you.
If you've not experienced his excellencies, then would you accept it today? Would you receive it today? Would you come to Jesus and say, I know that I have no hope without you, and I trust in you for the forgiveness of my sins based on what Jesus has done on my behalf? If you don't know what that looks like, I'm going to be available down here. I know that Nathan and uh, Shauna Thomas will be down here as well. We would love nothing more than to visit with you about what salvation's about. Maybe this morning we've heard the message and I, I don't want to be guilted into sharing our faith. I just want to be reminded of what God's calling us to, to proclaim his excellencies in the world. And maybe this morning you want to kind of clarify that in your heart and your mind. Maybe consider a mission trip. Maybe consider how you can do that on a regular basis at your place of employment. Maybe you just want to come and pray at the altar about this. But this morning we're being called to trust in the living stone and to allow him to make us into living stones that point to him. Let me pray for us.